I want this to be a dialogue. Um, Caroline called me just a few days ago. And she was like, hey, like, I, I, you know, sorry, it's a little bit late notice, but I would really like if you could do this. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. Um, and this is a topic, as Mary was just saying, that people are going to come up and ask a bunch of questions, like a lot. Uh, and I want to, I'm going to be hitting different things here and there because I don't want to just be talking the whole time. If at any moment you have a question that pertains to this, just you know, let me know and 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 please ask. Um, but kind of the topic of this is um, apologetics, but not so much how to answer specific questions. It's how to answer questions, um, because as maybe you guys have heard the saying, uh, "Give a person a fish and they eat for a day. Teach a person how to fish." and they can eat for a lifetime. So if you give people answers to apologetic questions, it's like, all right, I have that question if somebody asked that specific question. But if you teach them how to find the answers to these questions, then it doesn't matter what question somebody asks you, you have a way to get the answer. So um, it starts first and foremost by willing it, by desiring it. Um, desiring the answer. So I'm going to be going back and forth also between my own life. When I was in high school, uh, I was, I was playing a bunch of sports and I went to a uh, school up in Augusta, about 1600 kids. And of the 1600 kids, I might've known like less than 10 Catholics. Uh, so very, very big, uh, Southern Baptist area, um, up in Augusta. And so I was, I used to wrestle and after wrestling practice, guys would come up to me as usually one or two or three guys that they would just ask questions, you know, why do you guys worship Mary? The classic questions. And at the time I was probably a freshman in high school and I was like, Oh, uh, you know, let me, let me get back to you on that. Uh, and I, my mom would come and she'd pick me up and, and I'd be like, Hey mom, I just got this question. And she'd be like, oh, you know, I, I've heard this before, you know, and she'd give me an answer and like, wait, mom, don't leave yet. And so I'd run back, he'd still be there. And I'd be like, this is what my mom said. And, and after a while, I was like, I don't want it to be that way. I don't want it to be, I have to run to my mom every time I have somebody ask me a question. Like, I want to be able to answer these questions. And so looking up the answers and getting the answers and then being able to first, the specific questions, yes, but then knowing where to look for, uh, for the bigger questions and for other questions. So, so this desire, um, and it's kind of like a, it's almost, they play on each other. The desire sometimes comes from the questions because you're like, man, I want to know the answer to that. But as you know more answers, you're like, wow, I just want this just because, you know, I want to know. I want to know about the faith. Um, so a couple things uh, first. Has anybody heard of the word census fidelium? The sense of the faith. So in the, the catechism, which we're going to talk about later, this is a great resource. It's all shiny. Hold on. There you go. <laughs> um, the sense of the faith, the whole body of the faithful, this is 92, cannot err in matters of belief. This characteristic is shown in the supernatural appreciation of faith, census fide, on the whole part of the people, when from the bishops to the last of the faithful, they manifest a universal consent in matters of faith uh, and morals. Uh, so what does that mean? Somebody, I want what does the census of the faith mean? So I'm gonna make a stab at it. I can outweigh you. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna make a, a choose. Emily, give me your thoughts. What? <laughs> um, so I am, I'm, I'm thinking that you're saying like the whole body of the faithful. So like the church cannot err in faith and morals. Mm -hmm. So when we um, speak on like with the teachings of the church, we're speaking the truth regarding faith, faith and morals. Um, but I think that also means like individuals can err. Um, right. 
but the teachings of the church are inerrant. Yes, are, this is good. And JP and I were talking about this more on the on the ground level yesterday. Um, when you are living, it doesn't, it doesn't, if you're just, you call yourself Catholic and you don't live any of the Catholic teachings, it's not going to happen this way. But the Holy Spirit guides us in uh, our, our conversation. And so if you are living uh, in the faith, you know, following the commandments, uh, living in a life of grace, and, uh, you know, something happens, you go to confession, you know, you, you living in a state of grace and you are following the precepts of the church. The Holy Spirit will guide you so that when you hear something that seems contrary to the faith, it gives you a bad feeling. So this is the Holy Spirit working in your life. So the first guy kind of talking is just being faithful to the church. And this will give you a basis onto which to put answers on. Um, that when you're living it and somebody's like, oh, I heard this about the church once. I heard my my pastor back in, uh, you know, uh, old uh, Willamah. Uh, Baptist Church said once, you know, the Catholics, they they believe this and then says it. And you're sitting there and you're like, ah. and you know, you might not know what the church actually teaches on it, but they say this and you're like, that doesn't sound right. And if you're living faithful to the church, the Holy Spirit is going to guide you in that. And it and it's a prompting to look for the answer. So, um, So since this fit, I have everybody here has seen Sp uh, Spider-Man at some point. Uh, I like to call it the Catholic Spidey sense. Uh, so living faithful to the church is step one to defending the faith. Because if you're not living in the church, if you're not faithful to the church, um, you can't, as the saying goes, you can't give what you don't have. Um, your cup is empty. Somebody comes to you for a question you and, and and you don't live in the church you don't really care to live in the church then you're going to be pouring into them nothing you got dust in your cup does that make sense um so be faithful pray give witness uh here's another point I, like i said my points are just kind of all over the place um has everybody heard that quote that is always attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, how does it go, Mary? Uh, proclaim the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Oh, man. You know, he did not say that. Right. <laughs> he was a preacher. Yes. It, has, it, has been, it has been revealed. It's the big reveal now that he did not say that. Um, However, it's not uh, totally lost. Uh, we can use this a little bit. I like to say, proclaim the gospel at all times, in your words and in your actions. It's simple. I didn't make it up, but I like to say it. Um, so proclaim the gospel at all times, in your words and in your actions. Uh, because, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a high, school, high school experience that I had. But, you know, when you are acting as the gospel teaches us to act, how will the people know this comes from Jesus unless you tell them about it? Tell them about him. It's like, oh, he's such a nice guy. What a nice person this person is. And it's like, wait, you know, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. So always bringing it back to Jesus. Uh, so personal story from high school. Uh, my senior year at lunch, I always sat at a table. There were six of us at a table. And uh, Southern Baptists, all of them. I think one or two of them are now Southern Baptist preachers. Uh, yeehaw. Um, so <laughs> we would, beginning of senior year, we would all sit down for dinner, for lunch. Uh, that'd be bad if we were still there by dinner time. Um, We'd sit down for lunch, and uh, I would do the sign of the cross, and I'd pray before my meals. And they would just kind of like look at me, and they're just kind of like, and then they just keep talking and give me the looks. And I'm like, these are, you know, pretty like hardcore Southern Baptist guys. Um, they just kind of like look at me, like kind of chuckle and just keep talking and whatnot. A couple months later, they'd like, they'd just like stop. And I'd do the sign of the cross, and they'd just like, stop and like look around uh second semester beginning of second semester a couple of them were bowing their heads and by the end of the year 
We were all, it doesn't mean we were all praying together, but we were all praying before our meal. And uh, there is a power in the witness of what you do. And how many of y'all are in high school? One, two, three. Just three? Nice. Rock on. I was also once in high school, so you are not alone. <laughs> um, but yes, it is. You might feel awkward at first. Yes, you might feel awkward at first, but that is okay because they respect it. If they don't at first, they, they do, they will respect it. Uh, the sign of the cross is sacred and there's a power in and of itself. And when you do it and you do it correctly, because uh, you know, sometimes you see this and you're like, uh, you know, you want to live your faith and proclaim your faith. And I think maybe that quote that we said earlier can have some justification. If when you do the sign of the cross, you do it reverently. When you do the things of the faith, you do them in love and with meaning and with power. And that's a powerful witness. Um, the next point I have here, what to do when you don't know the answer. So somebody comes up to you and asks you a question. So you are now living your faith. You, you live the faith, you're faithful to the faith. You start witnessing to the faith. And this is the next big thing. You start witnessing to the faith and what happens? Arlene, what happens? <gasps> Wait, you're still muted. Go ahead. Okay. You kind of broke out right there. Could you say it again? Because yeah, what happens? Yeah, what happens when you start witnessing to your faith? When you start living your faith where people can see it, and not so that people can see it, but you do it and people see it. Two separate things. Well, I'll kind of like say from my personal experience, I'm the person like I don't really have boundaries. Like I kind of just like I'm a, I'm gonna do it because it's what I am used to. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I don't like, I don't know like all the prayers in English. So when people do them in English, I still do them in Spanish. At school when they're like talking about um, religions, I open up about my religion. Like I'll have my Virgin Mary cross on and everything about that. Cause I'm not scared about it because mm -hmm. um, in Catholic traditions, I don't think, um, I don't think a lot of people celebrate like the Virgin Mary, like we mm -hmm. did this upcoming oh, Saturday. Guadalupe. Yes. Yeah. So that was like a big thing for us. I dressed up in my... That yeah, that's that's that, that perfect. Way. That and it, I dressed up in all my cultural clothes and everything, and um, I was kind of just living for it because like there would be pe people coming out from the English mass and they would look at us and kind of just they would start asking questions like asking what is the story about why is there another man below the Virgin Mary what is he doing why is he kneeling there. And you kind of just have to explain to them what it is. Boom. You just hit it. So. I, I like, you made it there. You made it to the answer to my question. And I'm a huge fan. Uh, when you start witnessing, people ask questions. Boom. People ask questions. Thank you, Arlene. Um, and, and, uh, que viva la virgen. Amen. Uh, so people are going to ask you questions. And at first, especially when you first start out, you are probably not going to know the answer. And that's okay. That is okay. All right. Um, uh, Brittany, what is one thing you should not do if you don't know the answer? Um... Say I don't know? No, that's something you should do. What should you not do? <laughs> oh. You can just put a not at the beginning. Um. Of this. I believe in you. <laughs> um. Go with not say you don't know. So you don't want to just, you want to phone a friend? Phone a friend. Yeah. Pick somebody. 
um, I'm pointing at her. She just raised her hand. <laughs> right. Go ahead, Mary. Thank you, Brittany. Yeah, I feel like you don't want to like pretend like you know and then make something up. <laughs> Act like That's you know. right. You do not want to make something up because making something up is bad on so <laughs> many levels. A, it leads them astray. Oh, that rhymed on a dime. Uh, B, <laughs> A, you lead them astray. B, um, it makes you look bad as well, especially when they find the real answer. You're like, oh, yeah, I know that answer. Yeah, it's the, the, the thing, you know, and stuff. And they're like, uh, what? And then it makes you look bad, and it makes who else look bad? Somebody. The church? Boom! Makes you and the church look bad when you start giving out fake answers. You know what, this was a huge problem of the first few centuries of the church, probably still today, actually still today, uh, where uh, people would be like, oh yeah, you know, uh, the, the church, like for example, when the church hadn't yet declared like at the Council of Nicaea, um, you know, who Jesus is definitively, uh, you know, uh, fully God, fully man, and, and later on in, in Chalcedon, uh, the council where it's like, so people would be like, oh yeah, he's like a ghost and he did things, but not really. And it's like, that confuses people. Uh, and once those confusions got, got out, they started creating factions. And then, you know what we call factions today? Denominations. Dun, dun, dun. It's like, oh, I believe this. And now we're going to put that in a box and we're going to put that box in that building. Uh, and that'll be our church. So, um, yes, to be careful there. So, when you don't know, know that it is okay to not know. B, as we just said, don't give answers you don't know. Because, as we said earlier, you can't give what you don't have. What are some things you can do besides telling them you don't know? Because that's not very satisfying either. <laughs> Maggie? Oh. I'll let you decide who I chose. <laughs> Not I. <laughs> All right, Maggie Fogarty. Um, <clears throat> one thing I would probably do if I didn't know the answer is like find the answer with that person. Very good, very good, good job. Um, so you can tell them like, hey, I don't, I don't know this answer, but let's look it up. We're gonna get where to look it up in a little bit. Or if you need more time, if it's like a big question, uh, you can be like, and if they don't have the time for the answer right now, you'd be like, hey, you know, I don't know, but I'm gonna look that up and I'm gonna get back to you. And then guess what? You should get back to them. <laughs> don't, oh, you know, they're probably gonna forget. They're not gonna forget. It's gonna be this gaping hole in their intellect and they're just, it's gonna fester. It's gonna be bad. Um, so, this actually happened to me yesterday. I got a phone call from a friend. Actually, I got a text message from a friend. They're like, hey, I got this question. Um, you know, can non Catholics go to confession? And I'm like, huh, that's a good question. Let's look that up. So, we looked it up and uh, found out all the, the different rules about it. Um, if, you're interested, if you're interested in that question, we can talk about it at the end. Um, and then I was like, you know, I don't know. Let's, let's look at it together. So she looked up on the catechism, and I looked up uh, on, on various websites online looking for a reliable answer. Reliable is a very important word when it's put behind answer. Actually, reliable is just a good word, but reliable and answer are just too important connecting words um so we found the answer and boom universe saved for this moment <laughs> um so let's see so how do we learn hon i'm all over the place um uh okay i'll come back to that learning how do we learn how do we learn the whole study of how do we learn called epistemology, but that's not what we're talking about right now. 
how do we learn? Um, one, I would say, holy curiosity. Holy curiosity. I like this, that it's like, I want to know not only for myself, because there's there, there can be a pride in knowing, and that's dangerous. That's something to avoid. It's like, oh, I know all the answers. And somebody asks me a question, I'll tell it to you in a second. I'm going to show it in your face. You're like, ha, I know this. Which, uh, to take that over to the side for a second, that's definitely something to avoid. Because you can win all the arguments all day long. But if you're losing the people, you're not doing anything. That's not apologetics. Because part of defending the faith is winning their soul. If you don't win the soul, you've lost the battle. Uh, so it's about, um, and you know, of course, this is the Holy Spirit's work. So it's like if somebody, you know, turns away because you gave them the right answer and you gave them it in clarity and charity, those are the two buzzwords, clarity and charity. You give it to them clearly and you give it to them out of love. Um, so, um, if you're, if you're just shoving it in, the fa in their face all day, they're just going to leave. Um, and if that happens, you haven't done much. Um, so holy curiosity, a desire to know for the benefit of others, not for your own, just like, oh, I'm awesome. Uh, that's not what it's for. Um, also, wanting to know uh, for the benefit of others. So the, another more buzzwords, everything we do in the Catholic faith is for the greater glory of God and the sanctification of souls, okay? So uh, you're learning for the benefit of others, yes, but you are also learning because you love God. If you're learning for those two reasons, that's good holy curiosity. Amen. Um, so let's see. Oh, I got ahead of myself, that's okay. <laughs> um, one day at a time, this is my motto. This is going to be on my gravestone, hopefully. Um, one day at a time. You are not going to know the entire faith, uh, catechism, uh, etc. Catechism plus um, everything else. You're not going to know that in one day. It's just not going to happen. I have been in seminary for six years now, and... I was sitting there this semester and I was like, dude, you need to know so much as a priest. I was telling one of my classmates and I was like, I will never know it all. And he goes, oh, thankfully we don't have to know it all, all at once. And I was like, yes. So um, it's little by little and we learn stuff every single day. Um, it takes a lifetime. Humility, just talked about that. Don't wanna shove it in people's faces. Don't pretend to know it all. Um, clarity and charity. Wow, I got way ahead of myself. This is great. <laughs> it's like I wrote this. I'm just kidding. Look at these. This pride. Forgive me. Where do we look? Where do we look? Um, so can some people give me some examples of where to look and where not to look for Catholic answers? Oh, I just gave you an answer. <laughs> Emily, any ideas? I see you hiding over there. Um, I have a lot of ideas, but I won't take oh, all of them. Emily. <laughs> oh, did you say Emily? I did say Emily. I forgot there's two Emilys. Go ahead. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. No, I didn't no, know no. Was you go ahead. Emily. Saved uh, by Bell. <laughs> uh, I would say the catechism is a good place to look. Good place to look. Great place to look. Huge fan. I'm going to tell you a secret about the catechism in a second. Other Emily. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure. This is great. This is why we're here. <sighs> Thank you. Well, I'm going to ask you again later after we've talked about it. And then you will know. Okay. <laughs> Maggie? Voss? Okay, so you said you had given a clue. So we have the whole Catholic Answer series. So that's a great thing to go to. And um, one place definitely not to go is Wikipedia because literally anyone can put anything in there. So. Very good, very good, very good. Um, anybody else? I think your priest is a good resource too. Usually, yes. 
Wait, I didn't hear that. Say it again. Your priest. Oh. Yes. And he usually, I mean, he will know where to, where to send you if he doesn't know an answer either. That's what I'm learning. Like, you're in seminary, and people are going to ask you some crazy questions sometimes. You'd be like, whoa, like, let me get back to you on that. And a priest should at least know where to look up the answer if he doesn't know. This is good. Good job. Paola? Oh, Paola, I can't hear you. I can hear you now. Okay. Um, what everyone else said, and I would I think of my dad. He knows a lot of answers, so. Good. Yeah. So somebody who you know is, is trustworthy in the faith. It's very good. Um, so places to look, other places to look. Yeah, so the catechism, uh, catholicanswers.com. You actually have pretty good stuff. Or the Catholic Answers magazines. Uh, videos on YouTube, uh, but not all of them. I'm referring to things, to people like Father Mike Schmitz, um, Bishop Barron, uh, EWTN. They usually have some pretty good stuff. And the EWTN website, uh, the Vatican website, pretty good. Uh and writings from the saints. Writings from the saints is usually pretty reliable. So looking up good Catholic sources and knowing what good Catholic sources are, I would almost always point to the catechism as your first source. Um, you can look up the catechism online as well. Catechism, words that you're looking up, and, and it'll usually pull it up. If you don't, if you just have your, you know, paper copy, there's an incredible index in the back with a whole bunch of words. And you're like, hmm, uh, somebody's asking me, uh, what does it mean that Jesus is uh, uh, fully God and fully man? This is a very seminarian question. Uh, then you would look up hypostatic union. <laughs> so, uh, of course, you would, you know, you'd look up, you start simple, you start simple. And depending on who, you, on what the question is, but you want to have, and there's plenty of books out there that the uh, like Catholic Answers have put out. Trent Horn, Trent Horn's another really good one um, to look up. If a website's like covered in ads and it's like, you know, uh, I, I can't even think of an ad right now. <laughs> Just covered in ads, and it's like you you will know uh, you if you get to a. Uh, a website and it's like oh this looks kind of like a back alleyway don't look for answers there <laughs> so let's see so good reliable catholic sources oh another good thing this is very important at the beginning of a good catholic book it will usually have uh on the on the copyright page man it's so bright <laughs> on the <laughs> That's not helpful. <laughs> On the copyright page, it will usually have two Latin things. Uh, it will have an imprimatur. Um, and then, man, this one doesn't have it. Oh, maybe this one does. Even though it's the catechism, it, it has the highest thing. If, it, if it's on Catholic teaching, what is it? Imprimatur means let it be printed, and that nihil obstat. If it has those words, that means there's no objection to the faith here. So that's usually pretty good. Those two Latin little phrases, uh, you open up a Catholic book, that means it's usually pretty good. A bishop has looked over it, uh, theologians have looked over it, and, uh, and it will be helpful to you. Um, and as we talked about earlier, there's that holy curiosity that you're not, after you start looking up answers, you, you hopefully, the Holy Spirit will move you to say like, I don't want to just look up answers when I have questions. Uh, I just want to read as much as I can and get as much knowledge as I can in a holy curiosity out of love for others and out of love for God. Uh, so that when random questions do come up, you can just be like, oh yeah, I've, I've come across this in my reading. Um, so let's see. I think I've covered most of it. Uh, oh, can I add something? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And what you were saying too, um, 
like the a lot of these resources, especially the catechism, will have other resources tapped into it. So like the catechism mm -hmm. references at the bottom, <laughs> like uh, right. here's multiple scripture passages. This is from, you know, John Paul II. This is from this um, Vatican document. So things like that too. Whenever you hear somebody giving a talk and, and they reference a book, write it down and maybe you'll come across it again and it'll be like, oh, I think that I should read this, you know? So right. I think that's another one too. That's great. I can't believe we have, none of us said the Bible. It's a good place to look for answers, man. <laughs> it's okay. <I> was that. <laughs> oh man. Um, two other things. Uh, two kind of last things to talk about. Bishop Barron has this great video, um, and it was called like "Rock Star Christian Singer Leaves the Faith," something like that. And in this video, he talks about what is called naivete and maturity in the faith and so this is this is just something that uh to preemptively tell you about to tell you about before it happens um or maybe it's already happened in your life and you've already gone through this um the moment which happens to everybody when you start asking questions of the faith for yourself and uh there comes this moment where you're raised in the faith if you were if you were raised in the faith especially for cradle catholics <clears throat> but it happens for everybody. Uh, you're raised and you believe what your parents taught you because your parents taught you that. There comes a moment in your life where you start questioning that, almost everybody's life. And it's like, well, this is what my parents believe, but what do I believe? And these questions start popping up. Questions start popping up. Bishop Barron talks about <clears throat> three main um, responses to this. He says the first response is probably is is or it not so much the first response. They're not in any order. You're going to have one of these three responses. One is uh, you hit these questions and you're like, see, there's questions like clearly this can't be true. And then you get angry and you leave. This happens to a lot of people. They start coming across questions and they don't want they they don't want to look up anything and they leave um seven o'clock Meg. um so look you don't look up questions you get angry and you leave then the second one is you see all these questions you become indifferent and you're like well whatever you know there's questions it doesn't really matter and you become lukewarm and as it says in the book of revelation i will spit the Not to scare you, just so you know. <laughs> um, number three, he says, you you run into these questions and you want to push through them. You say, you know what? Let me see if I can find answers. Or somebody comes along and gives you the answers or you start looking them up and you find them. And you start nomming up on the faith. Nom, 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 right onto the faith because you're like, this is so good. And it's so deep and it's so rich and it's so incredible so those are the three you hit the questions you get angry and you leave you hit the questions you don't really care and you go lukewarm or you hit the questions and you look them up and you go super deep into your faith and needless to say that third one doesn't happen as many as the other two as much as the other two so when you hit these questions look into them knowing that there is truth knowing that there are answers on the other side. Objective truth is that which reflects reality. It's very philo philosophical, maybe, but it is that which is. Um, because, you know, some people, you might talk to them and they'd be like, well, that's, that's nice and good and whatnot, but, you know, uh, you know I, I, that doesn't work for me. You know, that doesn't, uh, that sounds nice for you, but it, it's not, it's not true for me. It's like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. If it's true, then it's true. And it's true universally. Um, the principle of non-contradiction, a thing can't be and not be at the same time. It doesn't make sense. Uh, I was on a mission trip once uh, and I was talking to this guy 
And, and very simply, I was just like, I was like, do you believe in the principle of non-contradiction? And that's like a no brainer. It's like, you shouldn't even question that. And the guy was like, well, you know, I was like, um, okay, let me ask you a simpler question. Uh, did that just fall? And he goes, I was, I was thinking like, why is this taking you so long? And he is like, I perceive that it fell, but it maybe didn't. And I was like, dude, you gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. Please stop. So I was like, let me give you another one. Two plus two. And he like stops and he looks at me and he's like, And I was like, no, stop, stop. He goes, I perceive it to be four. Like questioning himself. And I was like, dude, you're going to explode your own brain doing this. Like you're going to spiral out of control and enter a world that you cannot come out of if you do this to yourself. So yes, there is objective truth. And it is that which accurately reflects reality. That which is. So um, knowing that there is an answer out there, you can find it. Um, and, and the Lord has given us his revelation in Christ. And it is handed over to us, passed down to us through tradition, scripture, and the magisterium. Magisterium being the bishops, the pope and the bishops in union with him. So... Any questiones? <clears throat> yes, Rock, by the way. I just want to say that. Nithya, welcome. Hello. <laughs> I sit here in uh, mute silence. You guys can turn off your mute. I don't mind. Do you, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what are your, do you have any like, advice on how to, like, I guess, argue or just defend the faith, like, in a charitable way? What's, like, some of your tactics for not, like, belittling someone? Or, you know, like, I often fall into this, um, like, trap of telling people that dogs don't go to heaven. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for how to be charitable uh, yeah. in defending the faith. Like, I love the faith and I love the truth. Um, and sometimes I love the truth more than other people on accident. This is a very, very good question. Don't mute yourself. Don't mute yourself. Um, this is a very, 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 very good question. Uh, you know, it was kind of tough for me, actually. You know, my, my actually, our family dog just passed away last week. Sorry. 15 plus years. And, uh, and it's like, but, but, but. C.S. Lewis has, I think it was C.S. Lewis. He had this great little thing on that. And I'm going to talk about your question, uh, but I just want to put in, put in this little interjection. C.S. Lewis has this great little thing, and he's like, you know what? Um, your pet will live on with you in, uh, it, what was it? It was like, your pet will live on with you in how much it affected you because you, your whole life is going to be brought up before the tribunal of Christ. And the, the part that your pet played in that, you'll see your pet again in that. And, I, and it was interesting, you know, it's, it's a theologian's own perspective of it. You know, there are some things that we don't know, as it says in scripture, like, you know, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, uh, nor has it even dawned on man what God has ready for us. So um, there are some things like that, but, uh, but there is sometimes pious speculation or theological speculation. So anyways, that's a side note. Um, but it ties into your question. How to answer things charitably. First of all, genuine smile. 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 Uh, as Jesus said to a sister once, uh, sister, there's um, smile, always smile, because through your smile, I smile. And that's a beautiful thing. So if they know, here's another, here's a huge principle that I learned in youth ministry. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. They have to know that you love them and you're telling this to them out of love. So smile, uh, love them, and do not uh, give them, sarcasm should be out of this, out of this, completely out of this. What does sarcasm mean? It comes from two words. 
It, it means tearing flesh. That's right. Sarks and chasm. That's right. Flesh tearing. How about that? Sarcasm out the window. Hurry up and do that. Um, so, uh, looks like JP has gone to open the door. Um, um, so I'll have a, a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah, eight minutes left. Um, don't start. No sarcasm. No sarcastic looks. That is, oh, that hurts somebody. That hurts bad. When you're like, you don't know. It's like, duh, -uh. do not do that. Um, so you never want to make them, you never want to make the other person feel, um, or make them think that you think that they're dumb. That's, uh, -uh. okay, so no belittling. And I know that's hard sometimes. Like you are saying, like, it's easy to just be like, I love this and you're wrong. And you are so wrong that it's ugly how wrong you are. And uh, so you, you, where does that come from? We talked about it at the very beginning. Pride? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yes, this is true. I, I need to change my question now. <laughs> um, where does not doing this come from? Humility. <laughs> yeah. Living the faith and prayer. Okay. Yeah. Living the faith and prayer. Because you know that the at that point, so yes, pride and humility, yes. At that point, you know that these answers do not come to you because you're so great. These answers are the Lord's. And this is the Lord's work, the Lord's knowledge, and that he has chosen to share with you. And so to be humble about it. And so when you know this, that these answers are not your own, and that you are merely a vessel of the answer, uh, to help them grow in their faith or to help them have a relationship with Jesus, then as Mother Teresa said, you know, I'm just I'm just a pencil in the hand of the author. Mm. So so prayer um, and 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 living the faith is going to be the changing force for us. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? That was a good question. Go ahead, Maggie. Um, I was just wondering, like, a lot of the church teachings, it's not like a simple answer. It's so complex, and I just have no idea how to explain that to someone without giving them, like, six textbooks and a Bible. Nice. And a priest. Yeah. It's very complicated. Uh, well, here's one book that will help. In a few short paragraphs, they can get the basics of what they need or you can give them the basics of what they need. Yes, there are some questions that are not black and white, um, but the church does a pretty good job about explaining uh, her answers. Um, and some answers are tough for the person. So a big thing, you know, you have to use discernment sometimes. How receptive is this person? There's, I've had experiences where I'm sharing with somebody or somebody asked me a question and my mind goes completely blank, completely blank. And so we just kind of talk about, you know, around the edges and a little bit. Um, and I leave and I'm like, Lord, well, you know, why did that happen? And what I have come to realize on multiple occasions is that either A, they're not ready for the answer and they don't actually want to know it. Uh, or B, that I, actually, I said A and B in one. Uh, either A, they're not ready, or B, they don't want to know it. Um, and that when they are ready, they'll come back uh, if they really do want to know it. And some people, just like just like Jesus did this all the time in the scriptures, the Pharisees would come and ask a question, and he wouldn't either answer their question because he knew they either A, weren't ready, or B, like they didn't actually want to know. They were just testing him. That was the gospel like yesterday. Was that helpful, Maggie? Um, can I add something to that? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I've been in that situation a lot and it's with people I know and love and who knew me when I was Protestant and, um, have these really hard questions with really complicated answers. And I've noticed that sometimes it's just something that'll come up like every once in a while for months, you know, and I think like just not being afraid of like letting that conversation continue 
um, and building that relationship if it's not there or, you know, trusting in that relationship if it is there. A lot of these people are really my really close friends or family members. And um, yeah, it's just like something that like kind of like clockwork, you know, like right. dog succession comes up like every couple of months. Um, and I've like noted through prayer in time that uh, there's like some sort of receptivity to it. That. So just like trusting and in the Holy Spirit to work it with the Lord's timing, you know, um, cause it could take a while. Right. Good. Any other questions? Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, thank you Mary. Thank you, Maggie. Anything else? These are great questions. Yeah. Uh, I know that, I know that feeling where you're like, Oh, I'm just going to give you this giant book. Most of the time they're not going to read it. Uh, Sometimes they will, but most of the time they're not. So to break it down into little bite-sized chunks, and, and as we said earlier, one day at a time, you're not going to know the faith, the all the nooks and crannies of the faith in one day, and, and neither are they. So uh, little by little. And persevering. I should have said this earlier. Persevere. Uh, here's the little secret I was going to tell you about the catechism. I picked this up multiple times. You ready for this? It's a great secret. There are 2,000. 865 paragraphs in the catechism what that sounds like so much guess what eight paragraphs a day you'll finish in a year what and i say this and it took me a little bit longer than that uh even having a class on it in seminary so yes the lord is patient the lord is very patient but i mean look at this look at this these paragraphs are not that long. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, two pages. Two pages a day, basically. Some Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. But, and you finish in a year. And you will know so much more about your faith than when you started. Imagínate tú. Imagine that. <laughs> Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Thank you, Arlene. Oh, thank you, Paula. <laughs> so, anything else? Give me a question about anything. Hey, Jay, Jay Swizzle. Uh, is there anybody waiting on us? Just one. Okay. Hello. He's not here, but I told him we were finishing up, though. So. Okay. He's outside. Yeah. We'll call him eventually. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I also want to say, like, I know that that we talked today about how to find resources and how, you know, to approach the conversations. But if there are specific things that y'all are like, I really need, you know, like one of us in this setting to talk about this topic, like we would yeah. love to to find ways yeah. to do that too. Um, Cause I, I do think that it's, it's great that we've grown in, in community and, um, and being able to talk about that in a setting like this would be really awesome. So if there's a, something in particular, Mary was talking about apostolic succession, you know, like mm -hmm. if there's something that you're like, Hey, I really think that a conversation on this would benefit us, please send them to me, send them to, to your peers. Like let us, let us know that, um, and I think that can be something to bring up too. Um, and then lastly, for anybody who grew up Catholic, I think that the only other thing is, um, and, I, and I know you said this in other ways, but like truly do not be afraid if you can't find the answers to ask somebody close to you, like to ask somebody. Um, I think that I always struggle with this of like, oh, I should know that. Like somebody was talking about like after the gospel, like doing this the other day and they were saying something that I was like, I don't know the answer to that. I was like, I grew up Catholic and I like didn't know the answer to that. Um, and I think like, don't be afraid in that sense either. Cause I mean, there, this is what it means to be Catholic, constantly searching for truth. So um, right. Mm, I like that. That's right. That's right. So if there's any brief, like specific question, please feel free to ask. But um, yeah, that's, that's great. Caroline. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Be not afraid as, as Pope John Paul II started. Uh, open wide the doors of Christ for Christ. And it's like, yes, yes more cry. Um, so everyone, can I also say, I completely forgot to like, I just assume that everybody knows you because you're so amazing. <laughs> 
And I'm sorry that I didn't give you an, a full introduction of like, Esteban is a seminarian in our diocese, which is so beautiful and so amazing that like God is calling him in, in this place that he is right now. Um, and so know of our prayers for you um, and our just like Thank gratitude you. that that God willing, one day you will be a priest for for us and, and for our diocese. So thank you. Rock on. Yeah. Does anybody have any el anything else? All right. Cool. Does anybody want to end us in?